So welcome everybody from around the world to our monthly Q&A on uh, deep adaptation and related topics. And uh, as you know, last month we had Joanna Macy and before that we had uh, Carolyn Baker. Next month we have Deb Ozarko. But uh, today, uh, joining us mid-rebellion, it's a summer rebellion with Extinction Rebellion, um, and I believe Gail Bradbrook, the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, is on her way back from London now. So is in a is a train station. So excellent, Gail. Welcome uh, to this Q and A. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm sorry excellent. for the train noises. <laughs> uh, no problem at all. I mean, I love this uh, this this format is is fairly informal, and it's. Uh, I also want to use this format to really sort of dive into so things that we kind of maybe talk around the edges of our public lives but but have limited opportunity to really to really share uh more 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 widely so it's kind of that that personal side and the emotional side of of uh the climate crisis and what we're choosing to do about it so um i think we're going to have about 45 minutes together is that right Ah, oh, you're silent there. You're, you've you muted. Yeah. Um, I thought by uh, staying in the train station, I could stay quite close to two o'clock. I've got a train just after two. So okay. if we finish at five, two, I'll be fine. Brilliant. So what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions um, for the first half hour. And then, and then I'll ask people to um, basically we'll go to the ones that people have uh, have. Uh, uh, shared with, with Matthew and that we've selected and so we'll then bring other people in as well. So Gail, um, you, you were speaking in London yesterday and I was wondering what was the key message you really wanted to get across? Because you've, you've given a whole range of speeches before. Extinction Rebellion is now world famous, um, not even just in environmental circles. Um, so when you were obviously yeah, you want to get across something really key about now that you've got such a massive audience. What, what, what's your main message you wanted to get across? Um, it's not totally like that for me. I, I ought to do more of that. Can you hear me okay with the announcement in the background? Sorry yeah, perfectly. That. Don't worry. They're um, just, they're, they're they're just, just atmospheric annoyances. background noise. <laughs> I'm sure they're not very atmospheric. So uh, before I speak, um, I try and ground myself and I try and pray and ask for nature to speak through me. And I see what happens. I do have a few bullet points. The main thing that I want to talk to people about at the minute is scarcity, separation and powerlessness and what it means to not be in that paradigm and to shift paradigm into a, in, into a new paradigm of t feeling empowered, feeling together and understanding that we live in abundant times if we come from that perspective. So I often talk about how the power lies in the collective and uh, having a good time together and accepting the fact that there's a, a, a consciousness shift and, and things like that happening and what that means to personal individuals. And then I, I sort of move on to talk about um, uh, what I'd like to see in the future strategy as well. Okay. So you mentioned three core key words there. Um, can you say a little bit about what you mean by separation and overcoming separation? Is that quite a deep philosophy for you? Um, yeah, so even in the early rising up literature, we used um, Charles Eisenstein's analysis of the sort of underpin underlying crisis rather than just keeping it a systemic look at politics and democracy and economics and so on. Uh, and um, Mickey Kashtan has added to that the other two words of powerlessness and scarcity mentality and that's how she defines patriarchy and i think it's a really good framework okay so you're quite explicit with people that patriarchy is part of the problem or even perhaps uh one of the the, the biggest problems in why we're in a crisis well I, I i often think that words are not very helpful like capitalism patriarchy white right. supremacy you, you know they're sort of trigger words for people aren't they and uh, you kind of suddenly find yourself on some side of a of a sense so it's mickey Kashtan, m-i-k-i uh mickey Kashtan that, that defines patriarchy in that way i'm just saying that because it jumped up in the chat channel um Okay. Uh, but, but, but clearly we're in, I mean, in, in another paradigm, it's called wet eco, isn't it? It's the sort of disease of our time. 
that we're in. So I, I don't really mind which words are used, but I think that um, it's better to, to just talk about what you're talking about rather than using some label that other people will have me different meaning around. Yeah. And so one of the things within that is this scarcity mentality versus abundance. And, and I'm wondering, because when people hear about uh, the climate emergency, the disruptions that are already happening around the world, ruining people's lives, making millions uh, homeless, creating refugees, but also the, the fears that are spreading as we see the impacts on agriculture uh, worldwide, but also then in the West, and therefore how that's going to feed through in the coming years into the affordability and availability of food. How, how, that doesn't sound like... Uh, particularly a, an abundance worldview. So I was wondering how, could, how, how does your philosophy of abundance relate to that sense that, uh, that biodiversity is collapsing, agriculture is under threat, um, and the future might be very different, materially at least. So it, it's not in any way to be in denial about the problems and the problems getting worse. And um, one of the things we talk about is uh, visiting a new world in which we say that we need to stop harming and start repairing the harm and and as part of that there's going to be losses and we need to learn to live with losses and to and to that's you know that's part of what we're doing is actually facing the losses of these times another thing that mickey talks about is, is sorry I, i'm finding it really annoying with the trains i'm just hoping you're not but that's one thing talks about in terms of patriarchy is uh that really good responses to it are tenderness vulnerability and mourning you know mm. tenderness for ourselves being willing to be vulnerable in these times and and, and mourning what we're losing and what, and what we have lost so it's it's not to go oh you know in some hippie way it's all abundant we're in some kind of shangri-la but 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 an example i gave to people quite often is when we were hanging out at marble arch playing you know some random stranger we're having a chat and somebody else is playing live music and we've knocked up a kitchen in the middle of the road and we're cooking some uh leftover veggies that have been sent to us into vegan slop yeah. you know how abundant that felt compared yeah. to flying to ibiza and, and having a burger you know so there's abundance that comes from love that comes from connection that comes from uh togetherness and uh yeah sure we, we can't carry on having fast fashion and like uh, lives addicted to consumerism and um and and and, and that's got to go and then in terms of how deep this crisis might go um y you know if we're fighting over tins of beans like uh, abundance is not necessarily the word we're going to be wanting to use but the, the whole point of the rebellion is to start start doing the um mitigations and the adaptations to to, to those times so that <laughs> We, we, we're in as, as little crisis as possible. No, it's yes. just not to deny what's coming. So you're, yeah, so it's a different kind of abundance. And it's basically saying that what we, we've been lied to about, about our culture offering abundance when it just sort of, it offers competition and, and a, rain, a load of choice, but without, it, it takes away that original abundance through sharing, connection, joy, being together, all that. Is that, is that's the... Uh, something of what I'm hearing, completely yeah. and it never strikes me any less strongly than around children you know you have children you have this abundance of shit in your life as a result of having children like presents and crap and stuff that arrives and too many clothes and but you know loads of books but are new books and we were in with penguin today talking about this consumerism you know it's you don't have an abundance you don't have a feeling of abundance of of being able to be with other parents and children in a really relaxed way you feel absolutely pressured uh and and, and i and i and i think the other significant lack of abundance or the scarcity piece is 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 not getting to have a life with purpose at the mm. heart of it which is my understanding of part of the shift in the teal consciousness is is that you know when you when you're living to purpose and in that way you know you could define the most scarce thing that might happen to me in the next few years is i could get shot right i don't mean to sound melodramatic but i i have i'm completely accepting that as a possibility yeah. and that doesn't feel like a, in you know a life of scarcity that if it gets yeah. ended prematurely living a deep purpose right now is is is, is thoroughly abundant
so discovering living and dying with real meaning uh, is the greatest abundance that you're experiencing. And I think it goes beyond that. If you go back to the indigenous traditions, uh, it is something that I've been relearning or remembering is that lives are seen in the indigenous traditions or some of them in context. And the context is that you have ancestors. And so on my altar, there's pictures of my, you know, people that mean something to me who've died, you know, they're my ancestors and the people that are uh, coming after us in the next seven generations. So we're just here for some time. We've got something to do, you know. So That's that interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there's kind of through recognizing death and honoring the dead, you're, there's a reverence for, for the, the purpose or the meaning of, of life. It's like a way of reflecting on what is most essential about being alive right now. <laughs> There's, there's a reason that capitalism is an absolutely death-phobic culture, right? I mean, you, you, you think about what we do to dead bodies. We put them in, and it gets really bad in the States, where you put them in the ground and you, you fill, them, fill them with chemicals so that they won't even rot. And, and you put them in, in, in metal encased areas. I mean, we're so death-phobic, you're not even allowed to die properly. Um, I think there's uh, something, um, gosh, I've forgotten a name, but a, a woman recently introduced me to terror management theory. Have you come across that? Yeah, there. Yeah. that our whole culture and sense of status and is all based on our fear of death. I, I, I don't know if our whole culture is, but this idea that you're, you're willing to actually sacrifice your own children before you'd sacrifice a culture that stops you from looking at death and dying. It's that significant. So the examples that have traditionally got hmm. cited, and like I think in Mayan civilizations, they chuck their kids from the top of a tower or, you know, a mum who's celebrating the death of her uh, jihadi son who's just blowing himself up. But I think right. when I'm with parents who do not want to think about the climate crisis and they're like, do, you do not get to talk to me about that. You know, I, it, it's like, goodness me, how invested a person has to be that they're not willing to look that in the face and they've got children you know that i i, I feel like saying you, you do know you're chucking your child i mean it's too judgmental i don't say it right well, but you, you've you've just said it <laughs> child under a bus you know yeah i mean there's so that what is stopping them do you think uh you mean you've been talking to so many people since you not just with rising up but then the last well the for over, for years you've been talking to people about the climate crisis what what's stopping people waking up and then the next step giving their the rest of their lives to truth and love and non-separation what 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 is it well, that holds us back so, so we, we were in uh, penguin today with the senior managers the chief executive right the publishing house and uh, was with Don donica mccarthy and other colleagues and donica said to them have you accepted there's a climate crisis and where where are you at and what's clear is you can see it in the grieving cycle you know, a lot of people, there are some people completely shut down to it or whose lives are way too stressful to even be thinking about it. But a lot of people are somewhere in the grief process, whether they're bargaining with things or they're in denial or they're in some anger or they're dipping in and out. <clears throat> and there was a woman there who said, you know, I've just finished reading the Extinction Rebellion book and I, I had a, I, I, I felt what you're talking about. You know, I, there's, so, so I don't really particularly focus on people that are, totally shut down i think well you know there's no that's not really the role the role is to find those people that are having a wobble and i see them all the time and i just it was the same yesterday when we were sort of walking around around the civil disobedience in london it's like you meet people and they are so relieved actually and you honor their relief and say this is a tricky process and they're like thank god and say so, you know be with other people with this process it's it's dissolving it's transformative it's 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 gonna open something up so i think it's much more important to have the conversation with the people that are teetering on the edge of something and to be encouraging and and and, and like one of the things i say to people is don't don't start doing stuff for the rebellion the first job is to feel this you know um, yeah don't don't rush into action join the rebellion slowly make sure you really connect to the pain of where we're at and and come at this from a place of well, it's almost like this um once you really accept how bad things are and you're 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 grieving there's a there's a deeper power that you bring to, to this activism is that what you're seeing um 
I, the way I say it is that the price of uh, love is grief. You know, the two things are intimately linked. Uh, Rumi wrote about things like that, you know, right. the, the, the candles, your brand. And grief opens our hearts. And so we need to be open to, to loss and to separation because that's where the stuff of life is. And when you love something, uh, courage is what comes off the back of that, you know. And uh, I mean, this is, I think this is a Western democracy issue. I, I don't think every other culture is like this, but this is the work it feels like we have to do. Um, mm. Yeah. You I, I, I often say it's, a, it's yeah. the fuel of the rebellion right. is, is the grieving process. Yeah. Of course, that, that's quite a, I mean, for people who know about wisdom traditions, spiritual traditions, people who know about the, the heart of activism over centuries and the scholarship on that, would, this wouldn't be news. But a lot of people today, particularly in the environmental movement, bang on about how we must stay positive uh, and give people hope of, of, of making a small difference themselves to ultimately a bigger shift and saving this world as we know it. You, you come across those views? Of course. And um, I think we've kind of started to put them to bed, really, haven't we? I mean, Roger's original paper was Tell the Truth and Ask People to Act Accordingly. And he, he wrote the first talk, uh, in my opinion, the science and the maths of it was a bit ropey and it didn't have this grief piece in it, but it was a good start. And then I came across Jane Morton's work on emergency mode messaging and it was like the penny drops part of what you have to do is also hold a vision that change is possible and, and this is not to pretend to people that it's all going to be cool or anything um sorry uh, is that microphone better for people by the way I got a message to say it was popping so I'm, this is I'm, great I'm, yeah it's, uh, it's cool. very good as it is now um, yeah. yeah so um so I got distracted um uh, Morton yeah, and the, and, and the grieving process. So I think, yeah, I think we're done with that kind of idea that we can just give bit, people bits of hope. I, I did um, uh, a thing on leadership in the last few months and uh, the guy interviewing me just kept going back to the hope thing. And I was just like, you really have to get over this hope business. I love Derek uh, Jenston, who's a deep green activist who calls it hopium because it, it's, it's just yeah. this um, thing that hopefully, hopefully, I mean, my hopefully, even as an environmental activist, was, I mean, it's an awful hope, this, and I did name it from the stage yesterday. Hopefully, this is going to happen. Um, I mean, it's not like a really conscious thought, right? But if I, if I look into where my brain was at, hopefully, this is going to happen to somebody else, somewhere else at some other time. And what you're really talking about there is racism, right? It's just like, it won't be my kids. They'll, they'll be all right. You know, there'll be some brown kids somewhere. I mean, it's fucking terrible, right? I mean, that's where we've been with our hope that's what it actually means yeah you're right because because people talking about criticizing me and my work for not for taking away people's hope it's also ignoring the fact that what the un said for example last week that, that environmental disasters are a weekly if not more regular occurrence around the world already and millions of people are already starving or displaced because of climate impacts already so um I, I, tell I us about nice, uh, hope i do well yeah, exactly. I just saw uh, the word despair jump up in the chat channel. I'm not going to try and keep uh, up to, on, okay. on the words because I, I, I can't really and, and concentrate. But um, I can't remember who told me this, but Charles Eisenstein recently said every initiation has a moment of abject despair. You know, so this is not like you're not supposed to sit in. The, when we're saying like, don't get hopeful, we're not talking about sitting in abject despair forevermore. We're just saying that's that can be part of the process you know the emptying out the kind of you know the, the, there's nothing left to cling on to and when you like listen to the um prophecies you know what the kogi people are saying about it's done between 2024 and 2026 it's you know the deal sealed then i, I don't know if that's true you know but i, I think take that source as much as anything um you, you never seem to hear from any leaders that, 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 that of, spirit, of a spiritual bent that go it's definitely going to be okay or it's definitely going to be bad. And, and, and the way I take that is, is it really is down to us, you know, and, and, and it's better it's like that because whenever we think hopefully somebody else is going to sort it out mm. or hopefully it's not as bad as we think, we're just handing over something. And um, that you, I, I, I wouldn't say, if, if, my child, if I saw my kid in the middle of the road and a bus come in, I wouldn't sit there hoping I'd be all right, would I? I'd just run like fuck to try and knock them out of the way. You know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's... this is the criticism of hope that it somehow 
in, in normal parlance, it kind of means a passive wish for a better future that you're not really yeah. engaged in. And also that it, it makes you focus on how less how shit things are right now because you're hoping that it will somehow be better later. So um, you mentioned though earlier, Gail, wait, wait, so, so, Sorry, so, that, so, so then active hope, obviously, Joanna Mace's piece, yeah, right? Yeah. Hope comes from being active. But I think the other piece of it, and so hold your thread because I'm sure it's more interesting than what I'm about to say, but I, I think at the heart of this for me is absolute freedom. You know, I was at Glastonbury recently on panels with people and I feel like saying to them, have you not noticed it's all fucking changed? We can do what we want, you know, we can talk how we want. You can be an academic and you can just go, I'm, I'm going to publish this paper anyway. You know, you can say, because I've been trying to maintain a previous life and start a new life. And you, you've got to just jump in the boat and go, right, fuck it, I'm doing this new thing. Yeah, you mean, it's sort of like society, more and more people are experiencing their own fuck it moment. So it's kind of like a collective fuck it moment. Um, yeah, I, I, when I talk to people I, and they say, oh, that Extinction Rebellion looks like a good idea. And I say, yeah, so how are you rebelling in your everyday life? How many compromises are you making with your career, with your boss? All, all that why, why not just say fuck it this is more important than anything so um i mean sometimes yeah. there's a degree of privilege in that isn't there but you know it's some of us have right. either psychologically more um of a sense of being backed up and that we're not going to fall into a financial hole and so and right. so on but i mean mostly though um you get we, we are really desperate for good people in extinction rebellion and there's loads of money wants to come into the system and there's loads of jobs he's doing there's some systems and processes that need to be tightened up to make that yeah. flow well. But um, I think that's part of what's going to happen is, is there will be more. And it's not to guarantee people a bloody career or anything or even a manageable amount of money. But if somebody just sort of steps off and says, right, I'm, I'm doing this now. Um, well, look, I tell you what, I, I, I'm increasingly um, believing in um, my experience of teleology. You know, that, you know, when the hippies go like, oh, the universe will sort it out for me and I'm just handing it over to the universe. And what they're really trying to do is, you know, start, a, you know, being a yoga teacher and hope that that's going to pay the mortgage or whatever. I mean, there's doing that, but I, I think there's a version of, 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 of teleology that I know what you place today. I feel there's a little edge of it in the room. Sorry, folks. But anyway, um, uh, the, the, like, the experience I've had of, of, of teleology, of, of like being in dialogue with like an inherent purpose in the universe is if you're like genuinely saying, I'm in service, what do you need from me? I'm willing to do whatever it takes and uh, here I am, you know, like whatever cost, what comes with it, I, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I tell the universe my kids aren't part of the deal, mm. you know. But um, here, I, I'm willing to die if you, if you, whatever, so be it, you know, service. And then, like, things just line up. I, I, I can't explain, you know, things are lining up. I, I, I think uh, there's a sort of trust piece of, of, of trust in that there is something that holds us and wants us to, because we're supporting life, right? I mean, life wants to live. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier, Gail, I just want to bring back you back to something before we hand over to the other people. We've got around 50 people, I think, in, on, on this call now, so I'm going to start asking for them to ask questions. But earlier you said that a big part of Extinction Rebellion for you, I, I think you said, is, is how people can come together in a different spirit, and it's the kind of way that people are coming together is what we need, given the, the problems we've got. That are, that are coming our way, whatever we do. So it's that, yeah. it's that broader adaptation piece. And as you know, it's, it's where I'm at with the deep adaptation agenda, which is inviting us to start talking about how we can help each other with what's coming, no matter how much we mitigate yeah. or draw down carbon uh, now. Absolutely. The, the way I talk about that is prefiguration of the new society, you know, so it has to be a lot of more direct democracy. And we have to have confidence in our ability to make decisions together. So as much as we know the adaptation agenda is about food security and you know health systems and education whatever whatever ultimately it's about proper functioning democracy and being able to work together right so our self-organizing system and it's like we're just like kids learning at the minute how to do that but we have got really good guidance from people like frederick lanlu and again mickey Pashtan, is is to me is the foundation of an adaptive uh, new society um, of, 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 of grassroots democracy. And um, hmm. that, it, it's what you'd call the constructive program. And uh, oh, by the way, 
I mean, we're, we're in a strategy process, so it's not all nailed, but I guess part of me feels like, you know, with the evolutionary purpose of um, a teal organization, which is my intention for Extinction Rebellion, uh, that the, the, I, I do hope it moves more strongly in the direction of adaptation once we've done as much as we can with the civil disobedience. And so, um, and it's all drafted, but just so you know where I'm at, there's a kind of timeline where we move into the adaptation agenda within sort of 18 months in a more strong, you know, in a stronger way. Right. I, I don't I really can't imagine myself rebelling forevermore. It's just sort of at some point, I want to be in my community, like be, living and... So some of that adaptation like would be... Yeah, some of that adaptation would be what the local groups would be doing for their own resilience and their own ways of being together with less resources, with more disruption. I mean, that's already happening. You've got groups, I mean, the Stroud group, for example, is looking at food security, but I do encourage people to do it under a different label because right. I think that it can be a little bit part of the kind of collective denial thing is you, you kind of go into comfort zone and say, let's start a community garden or, you know, let's have this, uh, try and buy a woodland together or something. And the transition movement's been doing that for years and it's strong in Stroud, you know, and it's all cool, but I just don't want us to get into mission creep in XI. You know, somebody wanted to start a tree planting thing. And it's like, if, if, if a group wants to get into our regenerative culture and go off for a weekend and plant trees to feel cool and enjoy themselves, that's all good with me. But if we focus on tree planting, when you've got, awesome organizations like tree sisters and so on then mm -hmm. we're just mission creeping so yeah so given the fact that you're you're about system change you're about this has to be done at least at national level if not internationally urgently and be the organizing principle of any society political system or economy um how are you bringing the adaptation message in that because at the moment it's very much the mitigation is is the narrative during the, the when you're talking to the media is there going to be a bit more about adaptation you talked about 18 months time so it's not going to be in this summer or this autumn that you talk um i mean it's you know i'm no media and comms expert right but i mean if when i did the bays select committee i was talking about um what you'd said around power stations i did mention the adaptation agenda there <laughs> it depends how long you've got on any given platform right um mm. Uh, because ultimately, as I said, the first adaptation is, 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 is us being in good relationship to each other and having a good conversation. So that's the first baseline of it. And then, um, you know, what are we going to do with nuclear power stations and food systems and so on? I, 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 did, I did message that stuff. Um, and I think really, essentially, that's part of tell the truth, right? I mean, I, the original demand was tell the truth and... Um, and then and that means then working with individuals and communities and organizations to respond to that truth and that to me was always including the adaptation agenda you know it's yeah. never just like oh it's all yeah. gonna be fine because the solar panels or something great so i'm just gail what i'm going to do is ask you another couple of questions but then hand it over to others so matthew if you look in your telegram you'll see which questions i'm prioritizing i see you haven't 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 seen my messages in telegram so gail i want to take it a little bit uh more personal in terms of um i know you don't want the focus on you and and at the same time you're a very good communicator and i was wondering um what do your friends and those who know you say they think is key to why you're being so um either woke courageous reckless or stupid <laughs> What's, what's unleashed you? What's, what's I, I, do you know when I'd say that I was in a meeting today with Roger Hannum as well and I can feel something really strong in both of us that feels quite and I you know at the risk of sounding really weird and messianic or something you just have to honour what's here um, and, and my sort of like psychedelic experiences and ceremonial experiences about praying for guidance and embodiment of some something else to be to be in the box so like I, I i i what i personally do is work with a therapist who's also a medicine practitioner to just keep a check on stuff you know so it's like where, when does it move from you know is it like a, my dad was a coal miner so like being and like in quotes a leader is not something that's baked into my sort of hardwired into my brain as that's what I'm supposed to do in my life although I did always have that feeling that this was going to happen it's like this is not a surprise to me uh so I, I I'm not 
answering really from friends point of view i just say to friends just make sure i don't become too big a dick and i often say from the platform don't make any of us special so like being a spokesperson or trying to offer some leadership is not the same thing as becoming separated and special is it it's just like here's what it seems to look like right now and you can be sovereign in a particular aspect of your life but you know when the solar power people are doing getting the panels together to power the boat or the music from the boat or the people are organized they're they're sovereign i bow down i mean literally recently got on my knees and bowed down to two of the women in, in extinction rebellion at their knees because i think we have to like honor each other's gifts and what we bring yeah. and, and not do, do you know what i mean and there's a place i think uh, i've seen something of the rising feminine mentioned in the chat channel as well and there's something for me that's not i was you know with polly higgins and claire dubois probably i don't know coming up for a year ago and it's like there's some place where we just can't get separated as um as women leaders, it's in particular, the sisterhood is a, such a big part of this mm. for me. And it's not, uh, yeah, it's encouraging each other. And yeah. On that one, I think I'll uh, invite um, Christine, who has a question for you on, on that topic. So Matthew, if you could uh, unmute Christine, uh, and then we'll hear from, from, and also Christine, say where you're, where you're based, so we get a sense of where people are calling in from. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chris Jan is, is how you pronounce my name. Okay. Chris Jan, uh, yeah. hello. Yeah. Hello. I'm calling from Boulder, Colorado, actually. Um, and thank you so much for organizing this and being here, Gail. You're a tremendous role model and force of inspiration for us. Um, and I've watched you speak, uh, you know, at just everything I can find of yours. And when I find you most inspiring, no it's case. when you're talking about Please things that you call the feminist and you're referencing a beautiful number of... Christian, sorry, I'm just going to ask Gail to mute well, because it's very noisy behind, so I couldn't hear you then. Can you continue? Yeah, yeah. I just find you most inspiring when you talk about this thing that you call the feminine and you attribute it, you know, you say the feminine, as most of us are have been taught to do and perhaps is accurate, you attribute the feminine to a, uh, an elemental force and it's something that we all have access to and is in all of us. And yet I wonder, um, especially after what you just said about sisterhood, um, is there, even though it's very unpopular to talk about these days and most in the United States perhaps, um, that there is a sexed uh, capacity or even a gendered capacity, I'm wondering if you feel, Gail, that there is a particular role that women, females, must play? And if so, is that because we're endowed with particular capacities? I don't want to get this even more bifurcated and, and triggering to folks, but, but is there a role that women play in particular in this movement at this time in, in, in the way that adaptation is just as important as mitigation? Thank you for the question, more? Christiana. I'll stop you there so that we can, we can hear from Gail. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And um, I, I guess, yeah, I for sure think that everybody has a feminine side. I actually consider myself quite a masculine woman. I've been on a journey myself of finding my own femininity as part of a moon circle where we meet every full moon or pretty much every full moon. And we have done for years and so on and uh, around a fire held in a sacred way. And uh, uh, we actually, a group of us took that over and we have a very um, sort of, uh, gender queer friendly approach to that by the way but um i guess my understanding of the rise in feminine is it's the things around intuition there around that emotion is good to express um around connection and i suppose in the society that we live in the pressures on 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 let's say men or male-bodied people people being raised as men they, uh, uh, to, to close them those parts of themselves down you know and uh uh, it, it may it may be that people with female bodies have have more access to that, but I I don't know. You know, I know this evolutionary biologist is talking about uh, sex differences, but um, I, I I just sort of think we are where we are, aren't we? We've got to move forwards in our evolution, and um, so it's less about trying to say this put the I, you know nobody wants to get into a situation of saying women are the ones that are going to sort this out although apparently the Dalai Lama did say that I think that it's going to come from western women um 
yeah, I'm not sure I have more to say on it than that. That um, I, I don't want to get in. I, I'm really not ever into wanting to do anything that polarizes us and and makes people feel like oh, it's not my thing because I'm a man. You know, I mean, honor, honor, honor the brotherhood and the masculine and it's the, the, the role and, and and the healing that men need to to do and want to be would, in total support of that. You know, would you say it's about rebalancing the masculine and feminine in ourselves, but also in collectively in, in culture? those things yeah are... yes i would gem and you'll have more uh, eco warrior feminists wetting themselves for your for you saying that <laughs> are you referring to my rebellion speech yeah i didn't i didn't take any hallucinogenic hallucinogenics but i did wake up that morning with the words mother earth says me too in my head so i don't know where that came from but it, it it's it just it's like i had to frame it that way and uh yeah so um yeah for me it's certainly uh something the the idea of how we've oppressed the feminine in general but also the idea of the divine feminine is something i don't really know anything about but i feel compelled to learn about and to support somehow in in my own work on climate and i mean these are just you know frameworks that give us some clues on the direction of travel you know i don't think mm. you get too attached to any of them you know like Health, he healthy masculinity what that looks like i mean there's a, a, a version of toxic femininity that's uh, quite backstabbing and uh, disempowered and faffs about <laughs> i think you know right. it's not to uh, sort of over egg the women pudding you know we're the front line of mothers you know front line of passing on the patriarchy you know? absolutely patriarchy is co-constructed and obviously parenting is a key part of that isn't it so uh I, but I, often I hear that when I criticise patriarchy, people think I'm slagging off men, and, and actually it's, it's not quite that at all. <laughs> so um, we've got a question from John, um, and Matthew, if you could pull in, 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 in John. Um, oh, hi. You guys can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm John. I'm from Boston, Mass., and i um, involved in organising XR. I'm doing outreach talking to a lot of people at events, a lot of conversations. Cambridge, Cambridge Mass is a very um, concentrated uh, liberal hub, lots of progressives and so-called liberal thinking. Harvard University, um, maybe not so much, but um, I talk to a lot of people and when I try to talk to them about this issue, I get a, I get a, I get a, a, a wall pretty quickly on attitude of, Hey, we, we got this. We're the good guys. We know what's going on. You don't need to convince us. We're doing everything already. And um, I'm just wondering like if there's some strategies of how to, how to reach that, that mindset. Can, can you say more about what it is they think they're doing that's useful? Well, they don't, I don't know that they're, well, they, you know, they're, they're doing the traditional activist thing. They're writing letters to the editor. They're, talking to their representatives, they're doing petitions, they're doing marches, um, they're, you know, they've all got solar panels and, and fluorescent light bulbs. Um, I, guess, I guess I'd ask them what their theory of change is. I've got a talk online called How Things Change and look at various theories of change and uh, the one that talks about, you know, obviously one that says consume differently and there's another one that says, you know, work, operate within the current political paradigm um I, do, I guess wonder what they're doing differently that, that that's not been done for the last 30 years where it hasn't worked i mean you know the green movements fails right yeah. <laughs> we've had we've, i think the first ipcc meeting was like 30 years ago and carbon emissions have gone up by 60 percent so it's not not a good record so. i mean i guess the other thing i get is is Oh, you don't need to be talking to us. You need to be talking to people in red states. You need to be talking to the Trumpers, you know, those people. Well, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to change society, then I, 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 either you need to be talking to them or uh, you need to be clear why you don't need to talk to them. That's about yeah. having a good theory of change, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah we'll put your uh, speech link at the, at the description of the, uh, the YouTube video for, that we upload of this one as well. So, John, I'm hearing some frustration there, and it reminds me of uh, when Corbyn first got elected as leader of the Labour Party in the UK, and all my so-called progressive friends in uh, 
in London were like, oh dear, what have we done? And uh, wouldn't think twice about it. Um, and uh, I, I got involved and because, yeah, I wanted to, to help promote a very different way of politics, talking about values and so on. And we can debate about how well that's gone or not. But, um, but yeah, the, there's a lot of complacency for people who already have a pre, sort of predefined sense of I'm a, I'm a good person, I'm doing good in the world, I'm doing what I can, and everyone else is just not being pragmatic. Um, and at some point, um, you just have to go with your own truth. Um, and it can be awkward. I've written a, a blog just recently called Don't Police Our Emotions, which is all about, about how people quibble and criticize about, you know, upsetting people. And I realize in the end, I just have to accept that that's going to happen. That both the people who don't know me and close friends, they're going to slag me off or they're just not going to connect with my world and I somehow have to just live with it and just make sure I'm focusing on what's uh, what's my truth and what's the best way of engaging other people um, just and I suppose you know, giving people time to come on board when they're ready um, people have to go through an emotional spin cycle to be able to really to, 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 to join in meaningfully I think that's also what Gail was you were saying earlier uh, we have a question from Maddis um, about activists radical activism and <laughs> working with other radical activists. Where are you from, Madis? Hi, hi. Uh, I'm from Estonia. And uh, yeah, as Derek Jensen was already mentioned, I was wondering, what is your view on, on this underground resistance in the grand scheme of things? So are you expecting this to somehow emerge in parallel with XR or are you hoping for this not to emerge? Um. I'm personally all for it. <laughs> you know, if we're talking about the same thing, if you're talking about um, a group of people that are going to go to a fracking rig and break it undercover at night, great, you know. But actually, I'm not sure I'm going to know about it because if they're any good, they're going to have a good security culture and they're going to be keeping it quiet, right? So um, it, we, we've got to... Uh, I mean, I think the overall theory of change is, that I'm working to is that what you call above the ground... Um, mass participation, uh, peaceful civil, civil disobedience. And I, I think that's the thing that's going to see the main change. But in terms of stopping the stuff that's happening right now, totally, you know, from my perspective. Yeah. So um, um, we've got a question from from Susan and I think it's probably Susan has put questions that Matthew selected but also then has put one in the chat about the military so Susan you could just just one of the the four questions I think I've seen from you and also mention where you're from so just pick one of the questions please Susan because we, we've only got uh, 10 minutes left and I need to wrap up as well okay um, I'm Susan and I'm current I'm currently living in exile in the outback of West Virginia United States I'm actually a Californian um, and the thing about the military is you know we we point fingers at governments and corporations and nobody says a word about the military which is the greatest consumer of fossil fuels and the greatest emitter out there not to mention all the other kinds of pollutions like the noise pollution disrupting the whales migration patterns and all that good stuff. And nobody's willing to go up against them. Uh, they just don't seem to be vulnerable to the usual activist tactics. And it's, it's that, that, can I just say that's not true in the UK? So, uh, I mean, it's not as big as it needs to be, but some of our Elders in the UK are an amazing peace activist. In fact, Roger Hallam was a, a peace activist uh, back in the day. Um, the people that disabled the Hawk jets are still in our movement. And um, uh, I've been talking to oh, peace Kathy activists. Kelly was in on that. I love Kathy Kelly. Yeah, and Angie Zeltzer and others, you know. So uh, Quakers often. But um, I, yeah, I've been talking to quite a few peace activists about uh, we need a group called XR Peace that's... Um, <laughs> got that focus what 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 um what happens this september in the uk is this a thing called dicey which is um an international arms fair that comes to london and comes every two years and they closed it down two years ago i mean really significantly ongoing uh, lock-ons and so on um i'd like to see extinction rebellion 
uh, really getting involved in that and the peace movement joining us on the streets in October, October 7th, when we're going to be getting back in the streets in the UK. So I think those links are really clear. I mean, they're clear in terms of like, in the, again, I'm, I've just got a very UK perspective here, sorry, but, you know, there's an ongoing outrage of the idea that we're going to spend something like 250 billion on Trident, uh, you know, a nuclear weapon that would, the intention is you never use it. Um, and the car, and as you say, the carbon footprint of the military is outrageous. So one of our peace activists have put um, a lease put together on that piece, but it needs to be elevated. Uh, we've talked about having uh, solidarity actions at various embassies and so on. I'm completely with you and in, in agreement. And it, to me, it's um, where Extinction Rebellion needs to move next. It's part of the discussion, part of the strategy, hopefully going forwards is, is, is in the movement of movements. And uh, within that, we do need to acknowledge there are differences, right? I mean, many peace activists in the UK are absolutely anti-nuclear. Uh, and there are some environmentalists that think nuclear power is a good idea, you know. So we, we try not to have, like, we're not taking a position on a particular thing because we want to be a broad church and it's up for groups to make a case as long as they're not trying to call up the movement. So Gail, uh, sorry, thanks Susan. Um, I'm wondering, um, you've obviously doing things all around the world uh, and things happening at the moment, but the, there's going to be a big uh, mobilization in the autumn again. Um, and I was wondering if it works. I mean, if, if the, 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 it's interesting because people get excited about Extinction Rebellion, but they sometimes overlook the actual tactics and, and, it, and, and it's that it is a rebellion. It's about peaceful civil disobedience to create so many arrests that government loses legitimacy. Uh, it's a force uh, this to the top of the agenda and to even bring down a government. Now, some people say that that's naive. Some people say that that's, that's just hubris or whatever. I was wondering what happens this autumn if you get hundreds of thousands of people in, out in, in a particular country and many thousands of arrests and a government does seem to lose control or legitimacy, maybe in Britain, maybe somewhere else. What will XR do? What will you do? Do you, do you mean what would you do, like, sort of politically? Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's why we have um, a political strategy team, and we think about that in advance. And so, obviously, you know, our, one, our third demand is focused on a citizens' assembly. Uh, uh, one of the things that that team are doing is drafting bills, and there was a conversation last night about even drafting the budget. You know, what would a genuinely emergency budget look like? Um, but I think in terms of... Uh, an actual sort of collapse in a government type of situation. I don't think we've done the strategizing around that for the minute. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean that won't be thought about. I mean, um, I, th I think you just have to, have to do some scenario planning. Uh, there, there's active conversations across the political spectrum. And I think to, I mean, just, you know, off the top of my head, and I'm not a political strategist, it seems to me that you'd want to be having a conversation with the, all the different political parties about how, how you can have a new constitution in the UK and a new form of democracy that's actually fit for purpose. And it's not, I don't even think we've got democracy, you know, I think we've got a corporatocracy uh, okay. at, at, at the minute. And um, it's very, very captured anyway. It's certainly, uh, there's, a, there's a video of me online, and I'm going to post this one, but it's called How to Fake a Democracy. And I'm sort of, me and George Barder and others are faking orgasms outside the Houses of Parliament with 15 different ways to fake a democracy, you know, uh, how democracies get captured. I also think we've got I, more or I less know what, of... what do I do to find that online? Um, so <laughs> what happens? You worry that the activism might actually backfire uh, or be hijacked and if you do worry about it what are you doing to prevent it backfiring or being hijacked by people who don't share the the values the beautiful philosophy you've described now if you could bring your microphone to your mouth just as you were earlier it helps with the background noise yeah so um we have a policy of you know to stop co-option and it's about the movement dna the principles and values and strengthening how well we teach and share that these are all key concerns um to to, to try and avoid uh, things being hijacked and I think there also has to be like a non-attachment here you know because it's back to that hope thing again somehow you know like if you're not careful you sort of you know go into sort of white saviour mode as they talk about you know and you're going to rescue the world I mean 
I don't know, like I said earlier, be in service to something bigger than yourself and see what happens. You know, and one of our principles and values is debriefing and reflecting, you know, what did we get wrong? You know, maybe this movement will collapse by the end of the year and something else and learn from it and start. I don't know, you know, I just think we have to do our best and um, like, again, mitigate for some obvious things that you can see in the literature happens like uh, co-option. And, you know, the question that you just asked before this is one of consolidation you know tim g wrote a book uh, called counterpower and it's the four c's of change and one of the things that movements make a mistake around gene sharp which talks about this is not being re ready to consolidate their gains no re not being ready to, to to say okay we've got here so therefore this so that's why we do have a political strategy team but um you know it, it probably yeah. needs to do some more thinking it's also why you pause I see the philosophy of, of taking some time out to get your feet and your fingers back in the soil and, and, and just reconnect and, and reassess and, and make sure that you're not just being driven by the momentum. It seems to be quite a big I thing mean, that, for that, you guys. That, that, that's one of our principles and values is to have a regenerative culture. I'm not saying we always honor that, but you know, we start with check-ins and we have a land-based regenerative team and just met somebody who spent a month on a farm regenerating just, there's no point as becoming burnt out. And so doing the inner work and uh, tackling the oppressions between us and holding um, our actions in a really good regenerative way and connecting to nature, they're all part of our regenerative culture that we say we need. And, um, I, you know, so if like, I danced my pants off at Glass and we had such a good time, I didn't think that was time off from activism. I thought that was like part of it you know that yeah, actually because it was with kevin anderson and uh, uh, andrew sims it, it, sorry name dropping here that's a the professor of climate uh, science and yeah. um and somebody who runs the rapid transition alliance and the rebellion were all in all happened to be in the same disco in, in glastonbury it was a wonderful moment um dancing our socks off it's not you know it, it's not like time off even in a way do you see what i mean it's just yeah. living in these times requires all of that stuff uh, Brilliant, Gail. Thanks yeah. for that. I look forward to seeing you on the street or in a field or on a dance floor in the coming months. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody else, for joining us for this call. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the recording and sharing it with friends and colleagues, then just go to deepadaptation.info. And it's top right, the, the YouTube channel. I think Matthew will probably get it up by tomorrow. Thanks, Gail. Safe travels. Thank you. Thanks. Lots of love to everybody. Bye-bye.